We do plan to continue these Forestry Fridays or at least a monthly webinar in the coming calendar year. And we will provide a survey for the audience. If you are already a member of the Maine Forest Service listservs, you should see that, that survey come into your inbox sometime in the coming weeks. If you are not, um, you can visit our website, maineforestservice.gov and look for the Forestry Friday page, and there'll be a link to the survey on that page. Um, I just wanted to mention a few things. Uh, one is um, that uh, for licensed pesticide applicators uh, looking for continuing education credits, there is a survey that you'll need to complete at the end of the webinar, and Amy's gonna be putting the link to that survey in um, the chat. And uh, also um, throughout this talk, you can put questions into the chat. You may have difficulty with that if um, you are viewing this webinar through a web browser. Uh, so just a warning about that. But we will allow for folks to um, ask questions on their mics at the end of the presentation as well. Um, so I guess without any further ado, I will let Colleen Tierling uh, begin her presentation on hemlock woolly adelgid management. And I will ask folks to mute their mics. Okay, um, you guys can see my screen now? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so I am Colleen Terling, uh, one of the entomologists with the Maine Forest Service, and one of the insects that I um, am working with a lot is hemlock woolly adelgid. And there has been uh, a lot of expansion this past past couple of years in with hemlock woolly adelgid and its range and its severity. And I've been working with a lot of different people and a lot of the questions uh, about management, a lot of questions about management have come up. And so I figured um, a talk about integrated pest management for hemlock woolly adelgid might be a useful thing. Um, so before I start, I want just want to you, ask what is integrated pest management? Uh, so I went to um, USDA's site and they said integrated pest management is a science-based decision-making process that combines various tools and strategies to identify and manage pests. Um, so in other words, it's a sustainable approach to managing pests by combining biological, cultural, physical, chemical tools in a way that minimizes economic um, health and environmental risks. So basically it's using all of the tools that you can to deal with the pest in the smartest way possible. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking a lot about the basics of hemlock woolly adelgid because I want to talk more about, about integrated pest management, but I will just mention what it is. It's um, a small aphid-like creature um, insect that lives on, um, on hemlock trees. It is only found on hemlock. So if you have hemlock um, or if you have adelgid looking things on other species of trees, it is not hemlock woolly adelgid. It's one of the other species of woolly aphids or woolly adelgids. Um, it is found on the undersides of the twigs, tending to be on the newer growth, and they they feed at the base of the needles. They stick their mouth parts into the, the base of the needles and essentially suck the juices out. And if you look underneath all of those little white uh, fuzzy masses, you will see that there are there is a female underneath of there, and she lays up to three hundred eggs, um, all covered by that white wool. And then when those eggs hatch, they become little crawlers, as you can see over here, and uh, they go out and settle themselves on on new growth and start the cycle all over again. Um, where is hemlock woolly adelgid found in Maine? Um, well, this year it's found in a lot more places than it was last year, as you can see with the big red stars. Um, these are the new finds. We found it in 15 new towns in 2022. Um, and we're finding that it is moving inland and it is tending to move um, 
you know, down east along the coast. In this area here um, around Fry Island, around Sebago Lake, we did find um, back in 2016, we found an infestation on Fry Island that had been there for quite a while. And we had found that it, it did move a little bit to some of the towns um, on the windward side of Sebago Lake. And now thanks to the efforts of our technician, Wayne, he has now discovered it on in all towns surrounding Sebago Lake. So that's why there's this sort of inland cluster of towns. Um, it has been spreading from, from Fry Island to, to the various, various shore communities on the lake. Um, it is also spreading inland um, sort of up along the, roughly along the, the Kennebec Valley, and it's, it's definitely moving inland. Um, Gardner, the find in Gardner this fall um, was uh, the first infestation that is outside of our current um, quarantine area. So this insect is, um, and it's also in a new, um, the first the first find in a new county, um, Kennebec, the first find in Kennebec. Um, this blue area here is the quarantine zone for um, the quarantine uh, for hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, there, the regulated articles are um, rooted plants, so any live hemlock cannot be moved out of the the um, quarantine zone. And then hemlock branches or needles, chips with material um, that have branches and and needles with top material, and then I've also um um composted bark, which um, contains branches or needles. So if you are moving uh, things like that, you need to um, contact us for um, uh, compliance agreements uh, and and to be just be sure that you are maintaining um, compliance with with the quarantine. So I do want to talk a little bit about the crawlers. Um, March to July is when um, crawlers are present with either eggs or crawlers are present. Most of the most of its life cycle, hemlock woolly adelgids, they stick their mouth parts into the um, into the hemlock twig, and once their mouth parts are in the twig, they cannot leave. If you try to pull them out, their mouth parts are even longer than they are. If you try to pull them out of the um, hemlock, they will die. And so they cannot go anywhere. Um, they cannot leave their their hemlock um, their hemlock tree. But the crawlers. Um, and the eggs can be easily dislodged from hemlock, and that is when there is very high risk of, of uh, hemlock woolly adelgid being moved around. Crawlers are very, very abundant, very mobile, and very, very tiny. Um, you can see here, uh, this, is, um, this is the base of a hemlock twig, and the crawlers are just incredibly tiny. If you know that they're there and you have a hand lens or really good eyes, you might be able to see them, but most people aren't even going to notice them. Um, this is a sheet that we put underneath the hemlock um, hemlock branch and we tap the branch and doesn't look like there's much there other than some twigs and needles. Um, but when you look more closely, you can see that there are just thousands of, of crawlers. All these tiny little dots are crawlers. So if you are walking through a hemlock stand or working in a hemlock stand um, during that March to July period, you're pretty much guaranteed that you'll be picking up crawlers on your clothes, your hat, your equipment, your vehicles. And um, because all all uh, hemlock woolly adelgids in, in Maine are females and they don't need to mate, all it takes is one crawler to get moved to a new clean hemlock tree and we potentially started a new infestation. Um, tried to find something that shows the life cycle of hemlock woolly adelgid because generally people's eyes glaze over when you talk about life cycles and when you show show pictures of life cycles. But I thought this was a fairly good way of showing um, the two generations of hemlock woolly adelgids that we have in, in the Eastern US. Um, if you wanna think about it, there are, there are a lot of, there's a lot of terminology with hemlock woolly adelgid systems and progredians and sex operae, and you really don't need to worry about all that at all. You need to know that there is a long, slow winter generation and then a short, fast, um, short, fast spring generation if you want to call it a sped up springtime generation. So the long, slow winter generation starts actually 
in the the early summer um the eggs hatch in in maybe june or so and the mobile crawlers they wander around looking for new new hemlock growth once they find it they settle down they stick their mouth parts in and then they're attached to the tree um and they go dormant in the uh, hot period during the summer. Uh, it's called estivation, but it's basically just a dormant, dormant period. Um, then in the fall, as things cool down, for us, it's a, usually around October. They start to feed. They start putting on wool. They get fuzzier and fuzzier. Once they reach adulthood, that's when they lay their eggs. And the, those eggs then become part of the next spring generation. That happens Mm, about the the end of February, beginning of March is when they start laying eggs. And now we're back into a high risk period again, because those eggs can easily be dislodged and moved to another tree. Um, and then that next bed up generation happens quite quickly. And uh, we go through crawlers um, and and nymphs and, and through to adelgids. And um, this is the generation that will produce the winged adults. And for us in, in North America, this is a dead end generation because we do not have the tiger tail spruce, which they have in Asia. And in Asia, there's a whole other complicated uh, life cycle that, that involves sexual reproduction and um, will um, uh, involve sexual reproduction and, and a whole other generation that looks totally different. For us, we don't need to worry about that. Um, if you remember a couple of years ago, uh, there were millions, billions of trillions of, of, of tiny little insects that were on the beaches that were turning people's feet black. That was this, this dead end generation um, that, that was winged and they got caught up in the wind and blown out to sea, washed in and stained everybody's feet black. So luckily, because we do not have that host tree, that's a whole thing we don't need even need to worry about, um, which makes our life a little bit easier. So what are the components of, of IPM for, for uh, hemlock woolly adelgid? Um, monitoring is probably the most basic important component of any IPM program. Uh, if you don't know what you have and where you have it, um, you really aren't going to be able to make smart decisions about what you're going to do. So when do you monitor? Um, during March to July, um, the uh, the eggs and crawlers are present. We talked about that high risk period, and you can definitely see hemlock woolly adelgid easily. But if just be aware that if you are out and about in your hemlock trees, you are at a risk of moving hemlock woolly adelgid crawlers around. Um, so you you can monitor. But you need to you need to be very aware that you should not ever move from from infested trees to areas that do not have that hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, and just a close up of of the, all those eggs that are easily dislodged and the crawlers that are starting to wander around. October to November. Um, you again, you can monitor, but it's a lot harder to see hemlock woolly adelgid. This is a time uh, of year when the older um, the older females have died. Their wool is is being washed off, and this year we had a lot of rainstorms. And um, as you can see here, there's just sort of little white smudges of wool from the old wool, and it's really really kind of hard to see. And if you look closer at the new growth, you can see, yes, um, those crawlers settled. And so they are now settled nymphs and they're, they've gone dormant um, or they're actually they're starting to put on wool. Um, but they're still really small and it is tricky to see them. Go a little closer and you can see that they're there. So, yes, again, you can monitor at this time of year, but it's going to be harder to see. Um, some of the probably the easiest times to monitor are right now from December right through to February when you start to be in the high risk time again and then August through September and if you look at uh, you look at hemlocks now you can easily see the um the 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 white woolly masses they're quite visible and even if they are very low no numbers they are quite visible and you can see them so monitor you can monitor anytime but you want to be careful about the high risk season 
and um, you know September, August, September, and then winter time are the times when it's probably easiest to see hemlock woolly adelgid. Where should you monitor? Um, again, monitor anywhere that you have hemlock trees. If you pass one hemlock tree and on your walk, you know, take a look at that. If you had a hemlock tree in your yard, watch that. Um, if you have woodlots, um, you know, you can monitor anywhere, but you, the higher risk areas are along edges. Um, think of edges of roads, edges of lawns, edges of parking lots, driveways, um, along trails, anywhere where vehicles may brush up against hemlock trees. Um, birds will also um, move hemlock woolly adelgid, and so birds like edges. Edges are, are one of the better ways to look. Also, um, the branches tend to be shorter, or sorry, the branches tend to be lower to the ground on, on edge trees. And so that just makes it a whole lot easier to, um, to, to look. But as I said, look anywhere. Um, and, and if you have a woodlot that doesn't have edges, look at any of the hemlock trees in your woodlot. Um, and if, if the branches are too high and you can't see, you can't see what's happening up in the crown, look down at some of the lower, um, you know, the undergrowth. The eggs and crawlers will rain down with, with rain and, and, and wind down to the, to the understory. And, and often if you look at the seedlings, you can see hemlock woolly adelgid there. And then also, because it is really hard to see what is happening up in the tops of the crowns of, of hemlock trees out in the forest, take advantage of anything that brings those trees up from the top down. Um, this fall, we were we were doing some surveying um, in an area that was we figured uh, Adelgid was was moving into, and we had been out looking for almost an hour, hadn't seen anything. But then we came across a spruce tree that had fallen down, and as it fell down, it took down a, a hemlock tree, as you can see here. And as we looked at that hemlock tree, we were able to see that, yes, up in the top of the crown, there was one branch that was heavily infested and a few branches that were very lightly infested. So even though as we walked through, we couldn't see anything um, on, on the hundreds of branches that we looked at on, on, on the, the trees down at ground level, when we were able to, to look at this, this tree that had fallen down, we were able to find hemlock woolly adelgid. So take advantage of, of any felled or fallen hemlock tree. And also in the winter, let porcupines help you. Uh, when you're out walking in the winter, you often see um, hemlock twigs um, pruned off and, and dropped on top of the snow. That's a great little snapshot to see what is, is happening up in the crown. I will always pick those up, flip them over and, and take a look at them. And then how? It's not rocket science. It's really simple. You basically just flip flip over the branches and look at the underside of, of the new growth and look for those little white woolly masses. And when we do our formal surveys, we tend to look at at, at least 200 branches. Um, but when you are surveying, just look at whatever you can find. If you pass three trees on your walk, you know, take a look at a couple of branches of each of those three trees, and that's all you see. That's what you can survey. Um, if you have a woodlot, try to try to uh, look at at uh, higher numbers of of branches. So then, what are some of the other methods? What are some of the methods or things that can be involved in in control and managing hemlock woolly adelgid? So cultural control, cultural refers to silviculture um, and, and silvicultural methods, things that, can, that you can do to affect the, the growth of, of trees and, and make them less susceptible. Um, and I'm also going to sort of lump in some of the physical controls with this. One of the big no-brainers um, is, is uh, pruning your hemlock trees, pruning high-risk hemlock trees. If you think of, about the fact that that all it takes is for a single um, crawler to get moved to a new tree and how easy it is to pick those up, 
all these hemlocks that, that are overhanging driveways, parking areas where they brush up against parked cars, overhanging laneways and roads where trees may, may brush up against them. Um, think about places in your yard um, where, where um, service vehicles come in, whether it's oil tanks or your swimming pool, prune back hemlocks so that they do not brush up against uh, against vehicles that um, that might have, you know, you have no idea where those vehicles were previously. And, and uh, um, if if your trees are infested with hemlock woolly adelgid, pruning them back will help you reduce the chance of any of your adelgid from your trees being moved to your neighbor's trees or to trees far away. If you do not have hemlock woolly adelgid, even if you're a few towns away and you think, yeah, I'm not at very high risk, um, all it's gonna take is for somebody to come from some town where adelgid is to brush up against your tree. So if you don't have adelgid, that's going to um, reduce the risks of you finding, of you getting hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, it's not going to be a surefire thing. It's 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 no guarantee that you'll you'll stay free of, of hemlock woolly adelgid, but it can reduce your risk. And then trails. Trails are really important. One of the first things that almost every park does when they find hemlock woolly adelgid is to prune back overhanging branches, um, branches that people and dogs will will brush against frequently, um, and and that will reduce the 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 chance of spread. Um, that's a little bit closing the barn door after the horse has left. Uh, so it's even better to do to do that pruning before you get hemlock woolly adelgid. Just prune back some of your hemlocks branches. Um, and this picture, probably, if you've seen my talk, any of my talks about hemlock woolly adelgid, you have probably seen this before. Um, but this is on Fry Island, and it just shows the impact of, of crawlers being moved by vehicles. All of these dark brown hemlock trees here are still very healthy. They are in areas where they did not touch the, the parked cars. Um, the hemlock trees over on this other side of the laneway are also healthy. And there's one dark hem or one one brown, almost dead hemlock here. That is the one hemlock that overhung this laneway and it brushed against every truck that went through. And it picked up hemlock woolly adelgid, and that tree was pretty much dead, while all the rest of the trees were still very healthy. And you had to search very, very hard just to find a single adelgid. So it is not insignificant um, pruning back hemlock trees. And now I'm getting to something that people will probably throw rotten tomatoes at me because this could be kind of controversial, but bird feeders. We do know that birds pick up crawlers easily on their feathers and their wings and can move hemlock woolly adelgid around. Um, if I get a call from somebody who says, I've, I think I've got hemlock woolly adelgid in my, in my yard, um, if I go and I see one one bird feeder, I will go to the hemlock that's closest to that bird feeder, and that's usually where it is. So um, con consider removing your, your bird feeders during that high risk period from March to July. Um, and you might not want to do that, and, and that's fine, but just be aware that bird feeders are high risk. At the very least, if you could move your bird feeder as far away from hemlock trees as possible, that's going to help a little bit because birds tend to you know, flip back and forth between a bird feeder and one of the nearest trees, and you don't want that nearest tree to be a hemlock. Um, so then timing of major work is, is another, another thing that needs to be kept in mind. You want to time your work during that low risk period from August to February. And that that holds true whether you're doing you know, major harvests or whether you're having somebody come in to do, do major work on, on a hemlock tree in your yard. Um, I remember some, some landowner calling me up once and said, I called Company X and wanted them to, to cut down my hemlock tree because I have hemlock woolly adelgid. They said they wouldn't come till September. I said, well, yeah, that's because they're a good company. They're a responsible company. You don't want to you know, cut down a tree and, and, and have clouds of hemlock woolly adelgid, you know, poofing up into the air and then having to, to um, remove that tree and drive it around and, and have, have, uh, have crawlers just sort of um, 
being blown off as as you drive drive it away. So um, hemlock fully indulged, high risk period. Uh, don't do your your work during that high risk period. And then also you want to focus your IPM on your best site. And so talk to your forester about that. Um, you're probably not going, you you may not be able to save all of your hemlock trees. You probably aren't going to be able to um, because hemlock woolly adulged does kill tree, does kill hemlock trees. But the trees that are the most healthy are the ones where you will get your best return for, for, um, for biolog or for, for, for integrated pest management. Um, so think about things like where um, where are uh, where do you have good soil? Where do you have good moisture along streams? You probably don't want to be focusing all of your time and, and money on on um, trees that are on ledgy areas where they're prone to drought. Um, and what trees are less infested with hemlock woolly adelgid? If you have trees that their their crown is is half gone um, from adelgid already, those trees may not be the best ones to to focus your efforts on. Um, sunlight is also another um, component that there's been some interesting research done. Um, the research is showing that you know thirty to seventy percent of sunlight. Um, is best for the growth of of young hemlocks of seedlings, and also that in higher sunlight, adelgids do worse. So the the when you increase the sunlight, hemlocks do better, and the adelgid does worse. Um, and there's also been some some studies done uh, in forest trees where they around individual uh, hemlocks they will. Uh, cut a, a bit of a clearing around the hemlock so that it's in full sunlight and the adelgids do worse and the tree does better. Now that is not necessarily something you can take and apply directly to your woodlot because you're not going to go and cut, cut uh, clearings around every single one of your, your hemlock trees. That's not really a forest. That's a bunch of hemlock trees outstanding in, in the field. Um, but that is something to keep in mind. Where do you have the most sun? Um, if you have gaps, if you have clearings, if you have edges, those are areas where your hemlocks are probably going to be healthier um, with respect to hemlock woolly adelgid. So focus your, your attention on, on those trees that are the healthiest and the best, um, and, and you will have better, uh, a better chance of success. Also think about ecological value of hemlock or of hemlock trees. Um, and so that may may um, figure into your your um, calculations as to where you want to to do any any more um, intensive work like biological control. Um, look at look at the values of of those hemlock trees. So biological control, um, biological control is probably the one real long-term um, part of, of integrated pest management that, that may actually provide um, long-term control for hemlock woolly adelgid in, in our forests. Um, and so we have three species of, of, of predators that we have released. There are no parasites for adelgids. And uh, so and parasites are usually what we use in biological control programs. But because there are none, um, we are using predators. We have three species of predators that we have released in, in, uh, in Maine. One of them is, the first one is Laracobius nigrinus. Um, and I apologize because we have no um, common names for any of these. They just have the Latin names. This is um, a beetle that feeds on the winter generation, that long, slow winter generation. And it's, it's active all winter. It feeds all winter. It does not feed on the spring generation. 
Um, and although people were pinning great hopes on this originally, we're discovering now that because it only feeds on that single generation, it's probably not going to be the final answer um, for biocontrol because it will only, um, even though it feed, it may feed well on the winter generation, that spring generation is going to allow the hemlock woolly adelgid population to bounce back. Uh, so this thing has one generation a year. It At this point, it cannot be bought. Um, we get it through um, the, the U.S. Forest Service and the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid Initiative, and it is given free of charge to the state, and we release it, and then we monitor, and we give back um, information to the initiative, and it is essentially in some ways part of a, a really large um a large experimental program to see how it does um, to to uh, to help with with hemlock woolly adelgid. So it's probably not going to be the final answer, and um, but it may be part of the of the answer. Uh, one of the issues with Laracobius nigrinus, we released it for uh, a couple of years early on. And then we, the research showed that it was hybridizing with native species. And so Maine is very conservative um, and careful about what we release out into the forest. And we decided, no, we're not going to take this anymore. Other states still were releasing it. We decided not to because it hybridizes with a related species, um, and, which is an, a predator on adelgids on pine, white pine trees. And... Um, we know our, our pines, our white pines are under, well, a lot of our pines are, are under stress. Um, and, and this predator on pine trees, this related species, Lercobius rubidus, um, was, was keeping the, um, the adelgids on pine trees under control. We just didn't know what will happen if we start to hybridize with that species and will that cause bigger problems on pine. The research has been coming in over the past several years and it's looking like that may not be an issue. So we will see what happens with this species. Luckily, however, oh, and this, oh, and I should also mention, take a look at, at this uh, um, larva right here. Um, it's not usually right out there on the end of a, on a hemlock needle, but I put it there so you can see it. Um, take a look here and you can see over on the right-hand side, you may be able to see that larva there with its head stuck under a clump of wool, feeding vociferously. Um, and as you can see, this um, this twig over here, how ragged and tattered all of this wool looks, that's because um, the Laracobius nigrinus larvae have just been plowing through like miniature snow plows and wreaking havoc everywhere they go. They just barrel on through all of these um, little... Uh, woolly masses that contain eggs and larvae and go through eating everything. Um, it's it's pretty, pretty impressive to see what they can do. So luckily, um, even though we decided to no longer take Laracobius nigrinus uh, because of the hybridize, hybridization issue, um, there was another species, Laracobius osakensis, that came from Japan. It was less closely related to our native species, and so it does not hybridize. And so for the past several years, we have been releasing this in, in other parts of Maine. Laracobius nigrinus is down in the very southern part of Maine, where we released it early on and then, then stopped doing that. And now we have been releasing osakensis through various other parts of Maine. Everything I said about Laracobius uh, nigrinus applies to osakensis is exact, essentially the same the very same type of, of, of predator, except that it might be slightly more winter hardy. So that's good for us. Um, here you can see we released them um, on Mount Desert Island, just outside of uh, Acadia National Park this fall. And this is this disc of filter paper is about, oh, about an inch and a half in diameter. So you can see how small these little predators are. And they're about to head off and, and go feeding. And then the third species of, of predator that, that we are releasing in Maine is the Sagiskimnus suge. This is the only predator that can actually be bought by individuals. Um, it's expensive. It's anywhere from $2 to about $3.50 per beetle, depending on how many you buy. 
it's really, really expensive, um, but it is the only one that, that is available. Um, there are two generations a year with this species, and it actually feeds on both generations of hemlock woolly adelgid. So it does have the potential of, of being a better predator in and of itself for hemlock woolly adelgid than the two Laracobia species, which only feed on one generation. Um, we have recovered uh, Sasagiskimnus from almost every site where we have released it. Um, and the sites that we've been releasing in the past have been from pretty much Kittery um, all the way up to Wool Woolwich. Um, in recent years, or actually this last year, there have been a lot of, of uh, releases by, by individuals and, and groups uh, that have been further further east of, of Woolwich. Um, and we will see in future years if we recover them from those sites as well. Um, and I, I'm holding out hope for that. So Sajiskin the Suge is somewhat controversial in the larger um, environment of, of, of other states. Other states say it doesn't work. It never gets established. We can never recover it. Why are you bothering using Sasagiskim de Suge? You can't ever recover it. We do recover it. Um, it's a little bit difficult to say why we are recovering it in Maine and other places have not been able to recover it and other places don't think it works. Um, the only thing, you know, one, we are still looking for it and some other states, I'm not sure if they're looking for it anymore. Um, but other states may have released it in more inland areas or areas at higher elevation where the winters are colder than they are in our coastal region where hemlock woolly adelgid mostly is for us. And so that's that's probably the reason that 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 other states think it does not work. Um, basically, they say it does not work because they they cannot recover it. For whatever reason, we can recover it in Maine. Um, that's not to say that that we can say 100%, yes, it does work, but it's, it's looking pretty promising. Um, this insect is suitable for woodland areas, like all, all the species of biological control. Even though individuals can buy it, we definitely do not recommend it being used in urban and suburban areas. It's just not really compatible with scattered hemlock trees in a suburban area and, and the high insecticide use for all sorts of things, you know, people treating their lawns or spraying their ditches for mosquitoes. Um, all of those things are going to make it much less successful in a suburban area. So this is something that's suitable for woodland areas. You also do need a permit from Maine um, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And every group that I've been working with so far, um, if I work with them and I know where they are releasing and how many in, uh, how many um, predators they are releasing, I will just put that in under my my permit since I hold a permit. So that just makes life a whole lot easier for you guys. Um, so does this insect work? Um, it's kind of hard to say exactly. Um, oh, and uh, sorry, I guess I should, before I get onto that, um, this is, this is the beetle. It's a very tiny beetle. It's about one sixteenth of a, of an, of an inch long. And here you can see a larvae, um, heading into some wool to do some feeding. This is one of the little crawlers down here. And this is a crawler here. Um, you can see that they are very small. So does it work? Um, I got a couple of interesting pictures from one of our cooperators this spring where they released um, Sasagiskimnus on, on a land trust. And you can see on this picture on the on the left, um, this is this is the the level of, of hemlock woolly adelgid that they have. The, the branches are you know kind of white with with um, wool. Over in the area where they released, you can see that all those adelgid have been eaten. Um, when you look close up, you can see, yeah, there's little smears of white wool everywhere, um, but there's nothing left. Um, now, this obviously doesn't prove anything, um, but it's kind of interesting to see that when we released these, um, these Sasagiskimnus, they fed uh, voraciously, and then they took off. 
and and scattered throughout the the forest um and so this uh is an area in in Kittery in southern Kittery on Garrish Island where we re, where we found first found hemlock woolly adelgid in in uh Maine in I think about 2003 well before my time and in two, I went back to our archives and found some pictures from from that that time, from 2004. As you can see in the forest, some of the trees still look pretty healthy. You can see the green over here on the left, but you can also see that some of the trees are either dead or very close to dying. Um, they're in pretty bad shape, and and if you look closely, you can see that yeah, the the hemlocks um, are pretty much white with the delgid. This is an area that in the early aughts, we did release a lot of Sasagis gymnosuge. We also released a small number of Laracobius nigrinus, but largely it was Sasagis gymnus. And that was 2004, which was 18 years ago. I went back this summer to take a look at the trees that were there and without any other intervention, no pesticides, nothing else, some of the trees, yeah, some of the hemlock trees had died, but some of the trees were still alive. They were, I swear, they were the world's ugliest hemlock trees. You can see this tree here. It's got some dead branches. Um, the crown is looking pretty thin up at parts of, of, of the crown, but there are other parts of the crown up here um, where the foliage was thick and they were putting on new growth. Um, there was also some, some good growth over in this part of the tree. Um, down here, you can see another tree that, again, um, the tree itself overall looked kind of crappy, but but there were parts of it that had great growth. Um, and that's 18 years later. Uh, if, if you make a comparison with some of the areas further up the coast, some of the peninsulas where we didn't find hemlock woolly adelgid till about 2010 or so, in some of those areas, trees are already dead um, and there's some pretty widespread mortality in places. Um, so, you know, why why did trees die there um, within 10 years? And trees are are alive in this area where release the Sagaskimnus. 18 years later, the trees are still alive. Can we say definitively, oh, it's because you know solely because of of, of the Sagaskimnus that we release there? As a scientist, I can't say that. As a person, I say, yeah, it, it, it looks like the Sasagis gymnus is, is doing something. We go back to this area and we can find every year, almost every year when we go back, we find um, Sasagis gymnus in this area. Uh, also, I found there were some younger trees um, in, in the same general area, a little, little bit further away. Uh, younger trees that have grown up after hemlock woolly adelgid was found here. And usually when we go to a forest where hemlock woolly adelgid is, is prevalent and heavy, the first thing to die are the seedlings in the undergrowth. And then the saplings will die. And then the, the pole-sized trees will die in, in the sort of the, the, the subdominant trees. And, and the last ones to survive are the big mature hemlock trees. They've got the most resources. They can hang on the longest. But that uh, the understory hemlock, it disappears pretty quickly when you've got hemlock woolly adelgid, heavy hemlock woolly adelgid. But here we have young trees that grew up in the age of hemlock woolly adelgid. It wasn't the world's prettiest tree. It was you know, growing on the side of the road in some gravel and it had some, some uh, snow plow damage. And undoubtedly it had hemlock woolly adelgid damage. Some of the lower branches were dead. But if you look at the upper branches, it's putting on really good growth. And at this point in time, there wasn't a whole lot of hemlock woolly adelgid there. Um, what we see in, in, in hemlock stands is, is that usually hemlock woolly adelgid goes in waves. When hemlocks have good growth, um, that's what the adelgid wants. And so they will colonize um, that good growth and, and you'll get high populations. And then as the tree starts to decline, it starts to stop putting on good growth, um, maybe no growth at all. The adelgid will disappear. They will go somewhere else. Um, 
and and so then you may have a few years where there's no adelgid on the trees and the tree will recover for a for a bit and start to put on good growth again and as soon as there's good growth the adelgid will come back and so the tree tends to go in cycles um and will um it will look look good then the adelgids will come it will look kind of bad the adelgids will leave it will recover a bit and then the adelgids will um come back and the tree will decline again and each time as it as it uh, declines it declines a little bit worse these trees in garish island have gone through that cycle many many times and they haven't you know declined right down to the point of death um and in fact you know there some of them are looking not terrible is it due to um is it due to sasagiskimness hard to say definitively but if i was if i had hemlocks a hemlock stand and and was looking for biological control i would probably take that gamble because biological control is one of the few things that you can actually do for the long term um for hemlocks and now i'm going to come to a more more uh, uh controversial part of pesticides um i really really hate to to talk about using pesticides in the forest um insects are are under incredible pressure we know that that the diversity of insects is is reducing or being reduced catastrophically every year um all over the entire world and the actual numbers of insects are are being reduced um and and declining and this is just kind of terrifying because insects are kind of at the base of so much of terrestrial life they're at the base of of terrestrial food webs they provide environmental services people think about pollination but there're just so many other environmental services that are critical that insects provide and they are they're disappearing they're disappearing at a phenomenal rate and pesticides are certainly part of of the things one of one of the things that are endangering and and causing insects to disappear and so to talk about using pesticides in the forest i I'm, I'm loath to say that but also i know that that hemlocks stands are really important hemlocks are an important type of forest and they're important in in certain areas and if we do not do something to protect them they will die and biological control alone often is not enough to to protect them and so targeted use of of pesticides on individual trees can be a part of an integrated pest management program it can be very compatible with biological control when you do it right i'm not talking about you know broadcast spraying pesticides in the forest but targeted use on trees and before i talk anything more about pesticides i just do want to say the label is the law you have to follow the the label um legally you need to and also it's just smart it tells you how you can protect yourself how you can protect the environment from 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 degradation or contamination um it tells you how to protect the tree if you misapply your your pesticide you could end up seriously harming your tree um and also you just don't want to waste an expensive pesticide by not applying it right so follow the label because it's smart and because it's a law um horticultural oils one of the first things i want to talk about it is actually organic um and and uh so uh it is sprayed on the foliage you need to get good complete coverage and so that uh hemlock or small hemlocks you can use horticultural oil um it's a little trickier to get good coverage of really big trees it can be done there are some companies that do that but it can be very expensive uh horticultural oil targets the crawlers it essentially suffocates them and so you may need to treat every year or if you have a really high infestation and your tree is in really bad shape you may need to treat twice a year to to hit in both generations there is a high, higher label rate that you can use in the spring before bud break and then there's a lower dose that you use in the summer um to get the summer generation um uh, and this is something that you definitely do not want to use in the fall 
Um, and again, the label will tell you that um, if you use it in the fall, it will interfere with, uh, with the uh, waxy coating on the needles and you can end up with really severe winter damage. So this is something you can use um, and you can use this in the, with biological control. Another pesticide is triazin. It is a product of the neem tree. It is also organic. It is pretty much the only organic pesticide that can be injected into full-size trees. Um, it only provides a single year of control and it's pretty expensive, um, especially if you need to treat it, a tree every year. Um, you may be able to treat a year, two or three years in a row, and then as a tree recovers, you may be able to take a year or so off um, and, and allow the, the indulgence to come back because your tree is now a little bit recovered, a little more robust, um, but it is a fairly, a fairly expensive alternative, but it is the only organic alternative you have for full-size trees or, or the only alternative, organic alternative for injecting trees. And then neonicotinoids. Um, neonicotinoids, there's been a lot of pushback against neonicotinoids and, and possibly quite rightly so. Um, the neonicotinoids are incredibly widely used all throughout the world. They have been um, arguably way overused causing environmental degradation and contamination. They most certainly have been used, misused, and misuse can lead to um, horrible effects on non-target organisms, particularly bees. It's toxic to bees and has been implicated in, in bee kills. Um, but in a forest used on, on individual trees, it can be, um, it can be a, a useful a, a useful insecticide to use for for hemlock woolly adelgid. It is a wide spectrum insecticide, so it kill it will kill all the insects feeding on that particular tree. It is systemic, um, and so that tree basically becomes a food desert. However, because a tree an individual tree is is treated either um, with uh, soil. A, a soil application right at the base of the trunk or um, an injection into the tree or onto the bark of the tree, there is very, very little environmental contamination, particularly if you um, inject it right into the tree. Um, hemlocks hold on to their needles for about five years. And, and so by the time they actually drop their needles and their needles become part of the duff, um, you, you, uh, they're, they're, the, the, in, the insecticide has broken down. Um, and so this can be a fairly, um, a fairly environmentally safe way of, of, uh, of applying neonicotinoids. Studies have shown that there is fairly little um, contamination of, of the environment. Um, the tree does become a food desert. Uh, you're not gonna have birds feeding on that tree. You're not gonna poison the birds but um, they're, uh, all the food that they will normally feed in and that, on that tree is no longer there. And there also is um, a limit to the number of trees you can treat per acre. Trees can recover even, you know, up to 50% of the, the crown has, is, is, is uh, degraded and declined. Trees can recover with the treatment of neonicotinoids. We'll mention that um, Neonicotinoids are now restricted. Dinotephron and imidacloprid are the two that we use for hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, there is an exception for in, in forestry and and uh, and and uh, for for both in forests and and in, and in yards on, on private property. Um, hemlock woolly adelgid is is one of the trees that or one of the insects that this that neonicotinoids may be used for. Um, however, uh, because it is restricted, you need to have a pesticide register. You need to be a pesticide, um, have a pesticide license, be a registered or licensed applicator. And um, even on your own property, you now need to have a license before you apply this, or you need to hire somebody who is licensed. So the two neonicotinoids that are used, imidacloprid will move very slowly throughout the tree. 
and it may take up to a year before it reaches the top of the tree. And, uh, and it will provide long lasting protection, three to four years, potentially up to six years of, of protection. And so you may need to retreat every five to seven years to keep a tree alive. It works best as um, a soil injection or drench. So you, you apply it right around the base of the tree. Um, but because um, any because it will kill insects in the in the uh, right in the area where in the soil insects where you apply it, it also will be taken up by any plants in that area. So you need to be sure that you stop all flowering plants because you do not want bees coming to the tree. You don't need to worry about bees coming to the hemlock tree because it is wind pollinated. But any flowering plants at the base of the tree, you need to be sure that they do not flower. You either take the the plants out or or make sure they stay deadheaded. Or, or uh, flowers are taken off. The other neonicotinoid is dinotepheron. It is more soluble um, and it will move through the tree th faster within a few weeks. It can be used as a basal bark spray or as a trunk injection, and it will provide protection for two years or more. Um, it can be used safely close and legally close to water. Um, some of the, the injection systems for for dinotepheron are completely closed. So there is absolutely no um, movement of, of, uh, of the dinotepheron into the environment outside of the tree. And so... Hey, Colleen, I'm just going to jump in to say there's about four minutes left in the scheduled time. Oh, yes. Okay. I've got to move right across fast. Yeah. So interrated fast management. Um, this will we will be uh, linking to this on our on our website. Um, it is a really useful um, tool, or yeah, or useful uh, um, useful information. But basically, for integrated pest management, you need to keep your trees alive long enough for biological control to serve, to uh, to build up in numbers that they can provide control. And uh, how that will work is you will treat some trees throughout your 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 forest, um, whether you want to treat trees scattered throughout or treat trees that you think are more important, like along a, you know, a, a stream or an area, and uh, and uh, and those trees, the uh, you will release the the biocontrol and on the trees that are not treated, they will build up, and as some trees. Uh, Basically, you're going to let the, the adelgid hopscotch around. Um, they will stay away from trees that are treated. And as, as the treated trees then become um, uh, the pesticide protection wears off, adelgid will move on to those trees. The predators will follow them. And, um, and you can then treat other trees. And so you treat a few trees. Um, a, a few trees are treated in your forest, not, um, not all of them. And that allows the the pest the uh, the population of your predators to build up in numbers um, where they will eventually provide control. I would not suggest using pesticides alone uh, because you basically have no exit strategy. You would you basically will be having to treat trees in your forest forever, and that just doesn't really make sense. But with biological control, you are keeping your trees alive uh, in long enough for the biological control population to build up to provide control. Um, you can retreat trees safely. Um, and Laracobius, uh, you would you would treat in the uh, spring and it, you would give time the, the pesticide time to uh, to move throughout the tree and by the time the new adults emerge um, the the larvae or the the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid would be dead and uh, the the predators would then just not even go to that that treated tree we, if you have pe um, predators in your system and you're treating trees you need to use dinotepheron because it moves through the tree tree quickly what you don't want is for uh, an adult predator to come to the tree say oh there's good feeding here lay their eggs and um and then, then the pesticide continues to move through the tree. The uh, the adelgid become 
poisoned or die, and then that larvae would die from either from eating poisoned um, adelgid or from just having no, no uh, food at all. Uh, for Sasagis skimnus, whoops, sorry, you would you would treat in the um, in the fall. And again, with dinotepheron and potentially imidacloprid for the longer term protection. And that uh, would then allow, um, where, and then when in the spring, when when the new adult, when the new um, uh, uh, when the new Sasagis skimness come out, uh, they will go to trees that are that are untreated. If you have both predators present, that's a little bit trickier. But you would probably treat in the early fall, um, about a month before the new uh, Laracobius um, adults come out. You will you will have some um, Sasagiscimnus adults on the tree, but they um, are winged. They're very very sensitive to pesticides, and they will say, "Ah, I'm out of here." And and so adult adult predators can leave. It's the eggs and the larvae that cannot leave, and so you need to time your your uh, pesticide application to protect the eggs and larvae. And so, in summary, basically, there are things that that everybody could do. Everybody can monitor for hemlock woolly adelgid. Everybody can prune back their high risk trees, whether you're a landowner whether you're somebody who says, I, I want to try to save my hemlock trees in my forest, or whether you're a commercial woodlot owner and you say, I can't afford to, to do anything really expensive. You can, you can monitor, you can prune back your, your, uh, your really high risk trees um, along the edges of roads and driveways. You can time your major work. That's really important. Time your major work to August and to February when you're less likely to, to, uh, to to uh, spread and hem walk woolly adelgid. Focus your efforts on your best trees, and then biological control. Probably the the only real long term solution. Pesticides. Probably the only real solution to keep individual trees alive in somebody's yard in a suburban or urban area. Um, and it can be used in conjunction with biological control in a forested situation as well. And yeah, I'm right out of time. Sorry, that went a little longer than I thought. Hey, Colleen, we had a couple of questions in the chat that I wanted to, to cover live. The first one was from Hobie Perry. And it was um, regarding, I'm sorry, I'm scrolling up. Um, the uh, hemlock in northern Pacific regions coexist with with hemlock woolly adelgid. What's the difference in the east coast on the east coast? The the so research research has showed that it's not so much tree resistance that it, but it is the predators. And they do have predators there that feed on both winter generations and summer generations. So that, that's the, the primary difference, um, which is actually kind of encouraging for us here on the East Coast, because that means if we find the, the, um, the right predators, biological control should work for us here on the East, um, and uh, which makes it a whole lot easier than if it was tree resistance. Um, because you know, once we can get biological control out there, Research shows that maybe it will work to protect our trees as well here in the East. Okay, and Andy asks, how many Sasagis gymnus sugi beetles would be needed to be effective in a uh, 50 acre or so hemlock stand? Um, it's really hard to say. Basically, the more you can put out, the faster you will get to the point of, of providing control. Um, you can put out less and you may need to protect some of your trees with pesticides. Um, if you do go to, the, there's a site, the, the company that we buy them from is Tree Savers, and she does have suggestions with the number of, of, of insects you will put out onto trees. Um, but it will depend on, on how heavy in your infestation is, how long your adelgids have been there. Um, and, and, uh, essentially put out as many as you can afford to and be prepared to maybe protect some of your trees with pesticides if it takes a while 
for for the numbers to build up. I can't okay. really give an exact answer in number. And can you see the the new chat questions now that your okay. screen is no longer shared? Uh, yes. Oh, just a sec here. Yes, OK, so. Um, are there trees that are resistance? Yes, there are some. Not very many. There's a few so-called bulletproof um, hemlock trees that people are working on, but it's looking more and more like the the control is going to be more from the predator side of thing rather than the tree and resistance side. But yes, there are a very small number of resistant trees, and people are starting to look more and more into lingering um, hemlock trees. Um, and then that last question, probably, and then we'll end this, okay. is uh, about Winterport Monroe Winter area. Monroe. Any thoughts when it will be up there? Um, I don't even want to really, really predict. Um, because because human beings can move it around. Um, climate change, this is an insect that that, you know, as as winters become less severe, um, they are surviving better and moving, spreading faster. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't want to hazard a guess as to when. I would say do what you can to to try to make your property as as resistant to to hemlock woolly adelgid, like by pruning um, your your uh, your high risk trees, um, bringing them back. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think I have a specific answer to that. Sorry. Uh, so is that most of the questions? Yeah. So that's it. And I want to thank everybody for joining us. And just remind you that uh, there will be a survey coming out to sort of um, reevaluate how we do our forestry webinars in the coming year. So please look for that survey and participate in it. And I will put into the chat um, the link to the Forestry Fridays page. That is uh, where the survey will also be posted if you are not on our listservs. If you're not on our listservs, please uh, do con uh, consider signing up. We will have uh, the recording of this webinar on the Forestry Fridays page. Um, sometime in the coming week or so, um, once we get it all uh, cleaned up. So again, thank you very much. And I hope you have a great rest of the year and wish you the best in the new year.